Um, Good. Okay. So welcome back. Uh, last. So on Tuesday, it's a while ago now. On Tuesday, we looked at um, complexity theory, um, quantum com uh, com how quantum complexity theory. We saw one complexity theory result in physics that relates to many-body quantum systems, the QMA hardness of the local Hamiltonian problem. And I tried to give you at least some insight into how the proof of that goes, because I think it's important to see what what the proofs in these in these areas look like, you know, what's involved in proving results like that. And hopefully you've got enough of a sense of what the proof looks like that if you're interested, you can now digest the details from the lecture notes. Um, this, type, this lecture is going to be lighter, you'll be relieved to know. I'm not going to actually prove anything. This is because the results I'm going to tell you about are substantially harder to prove and more involved than the one I talked about on Tuesday. So if I tried to prove that, prove things rigorously, there's no way I would manage to get, get to the end. Um, so this lecture, last time we looked about, looked, we saw an example of uh, an important result in quantum complexity theory, in Hamiltonian complexity theory. Uh, and, how, and we discussed a bit at the end how that can teach us something. We learn something new about the physics of, of such systems from the complexity theory. We can get a new angle on, on many-body quantum physics in that case. Um, in that case, we, you know, it gives a prediction of spin glass-like behavior um, from a different angle than we're used to looking at things in condensed matter um, theory. And there are many other examples. That's just one example of applying complexity theory to, to questions of relevance to physics. Um, there are many others, not just in many-body physics, but also in, you know, in, in, ver in, in various other areas of classical and quantum physics. Um, um, but I don't have, I'm not going to talk more about them, those. Instead, what I'm going to do in this lecture, since we started the whole course by talking about compute building the foundations, at least, of computability and complexity theory, I'd like in this last lecture to tell you about or, gi uh, or give you some examples of what, of how we can apply computability theory to questions in physics and learn something about physics from computability theory as well. Okay, so there aren't so I don't know of so many results. Uh, there are far more results uh, applying complexity theory to, to physics questions, but there are a couple, or a handful, I should say, of, of results. And what I'm going to do today is to um, I'm going to just give you two go describe two examples of computability theory results about physics problems, uh, one classical, one quantum, that I think, uh, they're kind of, I think, well, one, the first one I think is particularly, it's quite nice. It's a, it's a classical result from the 90s that I think is quite elegant and gives us some insight into how computability theory can manifest in, in physical systems um, or whether it can. And um, then I'm going to finish by talking about undecidability, uh, undecidability of the spectral gap which is, I guess, a result that I'm, I don't know, it's probably the only result of mine that people actually know um, <laughs> from 2015. Um, not that people have read. The paper's too long for anyone to have read it, but people have heard of it. OK, so let's, um, before I start that, I want to make one note at the beginning, which you should keep in mind for the entire rest of the lecture. And that is that um, any computational problem and we know what a computational problem means precisely from le the first lecture. Any computational problem uh, on a finite number of instances is decidable. OK, and proof, you guessed it. I'm leaving this as an exercise. Very similar to the argument for why, or it's similar in kind of spirit, I guess, to the argument why the, but much simpler to show than the why the halting problem is in p slash poly. Um, so why do I want to highlight this? It means that in any undecidability result, there must be, must be an, in, so undecidability implies there must be an infinity hiding somewhere. or maybe not hiding, maybe it's in full view. But in any undecidability result, there has to be an infinity somewhere. So this means that if we're thinking about how what undecidability can teach us or what computability theory can teach us about physics, then we always have to keep in mind that any results uh, in this area are always going to be concerned. Whatever they're about, they have to concern some kind of idealized limit, some kind of idealized 
limit of a physical system. And we'll see in the two examples I go through how that manifests. Because it can manifest in different ways, in depending on the problem. Right, but there's always an infinity siding somewhere, which means that these any undecided result in physics is about or about a physics question is about some idealized problem or idealized model or some uh, mathematical idealization of the of the real physics because we don't really have infinities in nature or at least not in the lab certainly not infinite budgets anyway which restricts all of the systems to finite size okay but in some sense I don't I'm not going to go into you can go and go off and discuss this I could discuss for an hour and a half on the philosophy of this but I don't know any of it so you should go and find someone if you're interested in that go and find someone who knows what they're talking about um, but in some sense, deep down, all physics results are about idealized models of the real world, right? We, at least theory results, we write down equations and we derive things or compute things or prove things, but we do think that we derive things and compute things about the equations we've written down. And how those relate to the actual real world is a question for the philosophers. Okay, despite the fact that this might seem like undecidability is then a bit uninteresting when it's, it's just about maths, it's not going to tell us anything really about something we can see in the lab. Um, that's typically not quite true. So it's what, what the, usually what happens in that uh, the fact that you have undecidability in some idealized limit, there's some echo of that creeps into the behavior of the physical system for a fi the, in the non-idealized infinite limit. And you can sort of see echoes of this, the fact that in the limit, it's, it's un the question you're looking at is undecidable. You can see some echoes of very complex, interesting behavior in more realistic, non-idealized versions of the system. And so again, we're going to see that in a couple of examples that I go through, um, hopefully. So keep a lookout throughout this lecture. I want you to keep a lookout for where the infinity is hiding. OK, so let me give, actually, I'm going to give you three examples. I said two. I'm going to give you three. Example one of undecidability in physics. Ah, we've already seen it. Undecidability of halting. Uh, why do I claim this is about physics? Well, it's a Turing machine is something you can actually build in the real world. Um, and in some sense, that was the importance of Turing's model of computation as compared to lambda calculus or, um, or mu recursive functions is the fact that it was something that you could imagine actually building. It, seemed cl it was closer to the physics. So in some sense, undecidability halting is already a, uh, an example. It's probably not the kind of example you were hoping I would tell you about. Um, but the halting question for a Turing machine is, some, is a natural question you can ask about the dynamics of a system you can actually build. So where's the idealization? Where's the infinity in this problem? So the tape right, has to be infinite, for in, or is infinite in, non, in an idealized Turing machine. And if the tape is not infinite, well, you don't have a Turing machine, in fact, and you have something that, where the halting problem is, uh, is definitely decidable trivially. Um, so the, uh, the idealization here is that we're thinking of a Turing where this is undecidability applies to a Turing machine with an infinitely big tape. Now, of course, we could get close to that by every time the machine needs a bit more tape but has run out, we just attach another length of tape on the end, a finite length, to extend the tape a bit and then start it running a bit again. Um, and we will never get to infinite time, right? We will never be able to know if it runs forever because we'll never be able to, you know, it'll need infinite tape eventually or potentially. And uh, we'd, never, um, we'd never actually be able to keep extending the tape infinitely for, uh, because we'd end up in the heat death of the universe before it finished. But the fact that we can't decide uh, the halting problem means that even the behavior of a Turing machine with a finite amount of tape that can be arbitrarily large finite amount, if we keep extending it, is extremely complicated to predict. It's something that, because it's undecidable in the idealized limit, this is the behavior of this physical system is something we can't predict. We, there's no way, and provably no way of doing better in general than simply running it and seeing what happens. Right? Or you can simulate on a computer and see what happens. But you have to simulate it step by step. There's no shortcut. You can't make predictions about what the long-term behavior of the Turing machine is because in, even when you've only got un, an arbitrary large finite amount of tape. 
Okay, so that's a that's a toy. I mean, that's an example that we've already seen that you can make a reasonably good, compelling argument is is about is much closer to physics than than you know than maybe you might have imagined. So what I want to do now is to give you s two more examples about things that are a bit closer to the kind of physical systems that you would you see in undergraduate physics lectures in one case at least, and in the second case about questions that you really care about in many body quantum physics and not some artificially concocted question that no one cares about, but the spectral gap, which is something that people really do care about and matters in condensed matter physics. So, okay, so that's where we're going. So I'm going to start with example two is purely classical. I think it's rather nice. And but example two is uh, about particle dynamics in 3D. And this is a result due to Chris Munro from, sorry, no, I keep saying Chris Munro, Chris Moore from 1990, there's a follow-up paper in 1991. So the references, the full references with the link are on the web, uh, on the web page. I guess I should write that up again. At some point, I guess these will end up on the summer school website, but for now I'm uploading them here because it's quicker, easier for me. Lecture notes and references are all there. Okay, so to talk about this, what 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 is this about? It's going to take us a little while to kind of explain explain this result and explain where it comes from. But it's it involves some rather interesting maths and physics. The kind of the story starts with something called the Hale Smail horseshoe map. So what is this? This is a classic example of chaotic dynamics. Um, this is a type of, it's, it's a map where you stretch and fold. So you start with a unit square, or some part of a unit square. Let's have colored draw. Thanks, thank you. No? No, no thank you. I think that's white. Okay, never mind. Ah, that's a bit, that'll do. Okay, so we're going to think about two regions. Let's focus on what happens. We're going to define some map on this unit square. And I'm going to care about these two regions and not the middle third. So imagine we're, we care about what happens under this map that I'm about to draw to points in either of these two regions. So what, do we do? what does the map do? Well, first we stretch, we stretch out the square, say in the vertical direction. So our original square is here. We stretch it so, and I've drawn this a bit badly. Let's try again. Need a bit more space. So here's our original square is here. And now we stretch it so that this is region 0, this is the middle, and this is 1. They should be the same size. And then we fold it back on itself so that it maps back into the unit square. So we. Uh, have this is our region 0, this is our region 1, and then this is the rest of it. Okay, so we, st and here's our, our unit square is this part. So we stretch and squeeze in one direction, squeeze in the other direction, and then fold it back, itself, back on itself. And this picture is why it's called the horseshoe map. Sorry? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I'm actually, for convenience, I'm going to consider a different map uh, for the, instead of the horseshoe map. I'm going to, because the horseshoe map, this flips this region on its head, and that's just makes things slightly It's just slight, a slight pain later. It's slightly easier to analyze things. I mean, just up to some permutations. If I do something else, which as I connect, I fold the region back on itself like this. So this is now. Don't worry about this hashed region. We're, we're not interested in what happens to this. We're only interested in what happens to points in these two regions, not in the middle. Okay. So I don't care about. This is volume pre or area preserving on the bit we care about. 
Okay, and this is something called the this is called the Baker's map. The Baker's map. Why? Because when you're making bread, when you knead and fold bread, this is what you do. I'm not joking. That's why it's called the Baker's map. Um, okay, and I'm going to make the diagrams a little bit more convenient by I'm going to um, I'm going to not bother drawing these regions we don't care about. So I'm going to just schematically draw this instead as I'm going to close up the regions and just draw squares where I look at that region and I look at what it maps to. So I just imagine just closing up the gaps. This is just a schematic for the diagram I drew, the, for this diagram above. Okay, the map is still this one. I'm just representing it in a slightly different way. Okay, so if I do that schematically, this is what the Baker's map does. It takes these two regions and once you've done this stretching, squeezing, and then folding, it maps them into those two regions. Okay. So this is my map F. Now what happens if we iterate this map? Well... Uh, Good, I have another color. Excellent. So let me just div let me divide this up now a bit more because I'm going to iterate. Let's iterate this map twice, and let's keep track of a uh, few more regions. So let let's label the re these regions. Um, let's label them. So blue is this bottom part is uh, zero, as before. The top part is blue one. But now I'm going to subdivide those regions into yellow 0, yellow 1, yellow 0, yellow 1. Okay. And now let's see what happens as I iterate the map to those regions. So first iteration of F, this goes to, where do these regions go? Well, if you look at that diagram over there and think a bit, you'll see that you should be able to convince yourself that these end up um, so blue 0 ends up here, as before, blue 1 ends up here, and what happens to the yellow regions? Well, they get shuffled like this, they end up here. Why? Because these two regions end up squeezed up here and then re-put down here, and because it's the Baker's map, they don't get inverted. Okay, and now if I iterate this map again, uh, They're ordered colors, so it's fine. The first one, and you can think of just about the first and second one. No, I think I had it right. Sorry. Sorry. I was worried I had the colors the wrong way around. Are they hard to read or just hard to tell the difference between? Okay. Well, in which case, it works if you're colorblind too. You have to look at where the first symbol goes and where the second symbol. Because these are all distinct. Here. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, indeed. Good. And I erase the one. And if we iterate this again, well, it maps to. Let's do that color in case you can see the color. Then the regions end up. After stretching and squeezing, they end up here. Zero, zero, one, one. Zero, one, zero, one. Okay, so there's two iterations of F. So what is this map doing? Something is wrong. Why? From the first to the second. First to second. Why? So the top left is zero one. First, are you doing it on the small parts or the large parts? I mean, are you doing it for the zero and one starting there? The zero corresponds. No, you're right. Okay, sorry, you're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, uh. <sighs> okay. Um. Uh, 
I've made my life more difficult by using blue and yellow on the blackboard and blue and green in my notes, just to really make sure I'm awake. Does that look better? Good. And then we do that again. This one needs, these need flipping. And these need flipping. Okay, thank you. Everything's wrong. So zero, zero here, and then one, zero, zero, one, and one, one. Still not right? Yep, that looks good. Good. OK. What's the, what, what is this map doing uh, to regions? Well, each iteration, what does it do? It, if, I th what, what if, I, if this labeling, you can see that this is labeling the vertical coordinate of points, right? You know, just, but just the first few digits of the coordinate, right? If this is a unit square, then these are the, in, if I write it out I in binary, then this is labeling, this is the first two digits in binary of the vertical, of the, the vertical coordinate of points. Right? And after we map it once, one of the vertical, one of these digits has become the horizontal coordinate. And when we ma map it again, both digits have now become the, the vertical coordinate. Of, of points in these regions. Okay, so what F I what does F doing? It um, it shifts one digit of the vertical coordinate written in binary to the horizontal coordinate. Okay, so let's do let's represent this map in a different way. Or let, let's write the vertical, if I've got uh, coordinates x, y, let's write those instead as a number, a single binary number. Um, so this coordinate, it, this, this is uh, in binary 0, x1, x2, these are the binary digits of my x coordinate, and then binary digits of my y coordinate. And let's instead write our points. Let's put the x coordinate before the decimal point in reverse, and the y coordinate after the decimal point in the normal order. Then each iteration of this map, in this way of writing down our coordinates of the square, what does it do? It takes. Um, it's equivalent to a map on numbers. And what is this map? This map takes by infinite binary strings, right? A s infinite binary string that way and an infinite binary string that way. And it maps it to a new one. And it takes the nth digit and shifts it to the to i plus 1. In other words, it shifts it, uh, the decimal point one step to the right. So formally, we want to be formal about this. Our map F takes points to points. Right, that's our transformation of the unit square, and there's a homom we've just constructed a homomorphism to maps on numbers n, and this diagram commutes. Yeah. Mm, not in any sense I'm aware of. Okay, so we've got a new way of uh, and a different way of representing this 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 um, mapping of the of the unit square. And note that we know what the inverse map does as well. F inverse just shifts the decimal point to any other, or the, yeah, the decimal point to the left instead of to the right. OK, if I were to put my back the gaps between the regions in this diagram, then you should be able to convince yourself that what we've actually done is we've got, we've defined a map or this homomorphism is true as long as we take points 
in the 2D Cantor set. So the set where you take your square, delete the middle third, then delete the middle third of what you've got left, then delete the middle third of that and keep going. Right? That gives you the uh, 2D version of the Cantor set. And our map is really, this homomorphism is when, I mean, this, this equivalence is for points that are, as long as we start with, for, from points that are within the regions that never end up outside the square because they are not part of the thing that gets stretched around. So not in here for the first step, but if we keep on iterating, then some regions in the middle here, which came from somewhere here, are going to also end up outside and in this stretch region. So it's not very important, just an aside. OK, so that's nice. That's interesting dynamics. That's the a classic uh, dynamics, sort of a toy model of, chaos, of chaotic dynamics. And I'll come back to that at the end. This is a homomorphism between, formally, we have, a, have homomorphism How do we translate the map on points like this to the map on points like this? Okay. On this representation, we have our original map. On this representation, we have our shift map instead. So is the sigma inverse that you this Sorry? True. OK. Good. Someone's even more pedantic than me. Excellent. I like this. You must be a mathematician. OK. It does if you're a mathematician. <laughs> then it doesn't matter. Um, OK, so I want to think, let's think about some more generalized dynamics. So this is, this is nice, but relatively simple. I mean, well, we've seen that although this map of the it looks kind of complicated on the, when we look at the map of this unit square, but when we look at the map in terms of how it acts on in this representation, it's just shifting the decimal point along. So let's consider more generalized types of, dyna of shift dynamics. So more general map maps on the unit square, or equivalently on bi-infinite. Well, actually, no. Let's consider more general maps on bi-infinite binary strings. Let's consider maps of the form phi. So it's taking, again, this is a map that takes, I promise you eventually this is going to connect to the dynamics of a particle bouncing around in 3D. But we have a bit of work to get there. Let's consider a map that does this. It's, let me write it down and then explain. So, okay, so this is a shift, but iterated some number f of n times. Um, so sigma is, the sh is still our shift map. F of n, well, f is actually just takes some finite number of bits to an integer. So k is some constant, finite constant. Um, what does it do? It's, it's, um, it looks at the bits, the k bits after the decimal point. And just in the out and the this value of the function is just depends on the k bits after the first k bits after the decimal point, and we extend to the um, you know we extend in the obvious way to um, let's just say that it uh, only depends on on k bits after the decimal point. And so this tells us this tells us how much we need to how much we should shift. And which direction? Because this can be negative, so we can either shift right or shift left. Yeah. But only a finite number, right? Okay, and now G, what is this G? This is something a bit more interesting. So this again, 
This is a, just looks at a finite number of bits, let's say L, after the decimal point. And now, but what does G do? It replaces those L bits. after the decimal point by some new values. Right, so it just, depending on what the value of those L bits are, it replaces it with some new string of L bits. Okay, so this is a generalization of the shift map. It's quite a big generalization now. We're not just, we can shift by in either direction in each iteration, depending on the values of some bits near the decimal point. Plus we can sub swap out some of the bits around the, uh, near the decimal point with new ones. So do these generalized shift, these are called generalized shift maps. Do they correspond to some mapping of the unit square? Well, and the answer is yes. I'm not going to prove it, but the let me give you a kind of intuition of why why this is the case. Um, well, shifting we already know that corresponds to stretching and squeezing. We've already seen that, and shifting by some bigger amount just corresponds to stretching and squeezing more times. OK, but now we stretching and squeezing, but not always by the same amount. It, uh, how much we stretch and squeeze in which direction might depend on which point we're at, right? the few digits after the decimal point. So that, that means we stretch and squeeze different regions of the unit square by different amounts. And finally, our substitution, our G, what is G doing? Well, we're just exchanging some finite number of bits for another. That means we're just, if we're pointers in one region, we just move it to a different region. So G is just, corresponds to uh, exchanging regions of our unit square. And you can prove that all of this fits together consistently. And, or you can prove, I don't know, but at least Chris Moore proved that he proved the following lemma. Any generalized shift map does indeed correspond to the, corresponds to a, uh, piecewise linear on the unit square and this is in both directions any piecewise linear map on the unit square corresponds to that you can write down corresponds to a generalized shift map it's not continuous it's piecewise linear so on each region it's linear but it breaks it up into different regions. Let me show you an example. Here's an example. Um, so proof, go and see, read, that, read the paper. It's in the long 1991 paper, not the short PRL from 1990. Let's take this map. So F looks at just one bit after the decimal point and says to either shift right one step or shift left one step, depending on the value. And G just flips the bit. Take G to just flip the bit after the decimal point. What does this look like How, as a mapping of the unit square? Or what mapping does it correspond to? Well, it turns out, and you can go away and convince yourself of this. I'm not going to prove it, but just to see an example. This is what it does to the unit square. This is an example taken, this is taken from the paper, from Chris Moore's paper. This is just a picture. I don't expect you to necessarily have any intuition about how that comes from there. Or maybe you do. I don't. I'd have to work it out. 
But just to see what kind of thing this looks like. So how does this map the region? So C gets you know, moved and stretched into this region here. A gets stretched over to here, etc. So this looks like I've done something new. It looks like I've, I've constructed a new dynamics. It doesn't look anything like I've just defined something. It doesn't look anything like we've seen before. It has this correspondence to mappings of the unit sphere. But in fact, what I've just done, these generalized shift maps, can anyone, does anyone recognize them? Yep, in lecture one. Yeah, these generalized shift maps are, are just a Turing machine in disguise. So let me flesh that out. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to formally prove, but you, you'll see. Just give you a, but you'll see from this what I say is that you know, why this is true. So this we're going to prove the Church-Turing thesis for for the generalized shift. In other words, any Turing machine can be simulated by a generalized shift map, and any generalized shift map is sim can be simulated on a Turing machine. The fact that you can simulate a generalized shift map on a Turing machine is trivial. You just program the Turing machine to, to do it. So it's the other direction that's interesting. Um, how do I do it? Well, I'm just going to write. Remember, I have this. This is a map on by infinite bit strings. So what am I going to what bit string am I going to take to correspond to the configuration of my Turing machine? I'm going to take the symbols on the tape up to the depth, and then I'm going to put a Q which is the internal state of my Turing machine and I'm going to put that decimal point just before where the head is. So the and then I'm going to write the symbols from the right half of the tape. So all of the tape that's to the left of the head goes before the decimal point, and after the decimal point comes the head, the, the internal state, and which also tells us where the head is, the symbol that's under the head, and then all of the tape that comes to the right of the um, head comes afterwards. And okay, you're going to complain that this is not binary, but what I do is I each of these, I map all of the elements of my alphabet sigma, so my yeah my alphabet sigma, and my um, state set of states on my Turing machine. Right, we have a Turing machine. Remember, consists of an alphabet set of internal states and the transition table of transition rules. All of these states I map to uh, different uh, distinct binary strings. So when I write Sigma minus three here. I mean, whatever the tape state is, at, tape symbol is at, at cell minus three. I write the binary string that I'm coding that with. Is the, what, why do you skip two there? Uh, because I made a typo. Thanks. And finally, uh, what else? We've got a blank symbol, right? I mean, our 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 we have a blank symbol that fills up all of the tape at the beginning except for a finite number. We'll represent that by the zero binary string. Okay, so that means finite tape configurations correspond to, fi tape configurations with a finite number of non-blank symbols correspond to finite bin um, binary strings, finite numbers. And then how can I m implement a generalized shift map that does the same thing as our Turing machine? Well, I just put the, write the uh, generalized shift map. I take the, take the transition rules of my Turing machine and just write the generalized shift map that corresponds to them in the obvious way. So I've got to, the Turing machine, only, in fact, I only need to look at two symbols. I need to look at the one that the head is currently under, over, and the, um, I need to look at the, sorry, the internal state and the symbol that the head is over. And based on that, I decide whether to shift by minus one or plus one, and what new um, state to go to, and what new uh, symbol to write. Okay. So these generalized shift maps are actually just Turing machines in disguise. But, and that means, for example, there exists, or we can construct, even, 
a universal generalized shift map that corresponds to a universal Turing machine. But now we know that the halting problem for the universal Turing machine, we give what does the does the Turing machine halt on input on some on some given input, yes or no, is undecidable. So that means there's some question about our generalized shift map that's undecidable. And what is the question that's undecidable? It's let's call it the gra generalized shift reachability problem. Input a point and a region R in my unit square output yes if x, y ever lands in R and otherwise no. And theorem this problem is undecidable. Right? There's nothing we the proof is we've pretty much already done all the work, right? So the proof is take the XY to be the point that corresponds to whatever the input is I want to ask my Turing machine halting question for, if we've got up there in that way. And take R to be the region that corresponds to the halting symbol, to QF. So Proof, take uh, sigma the input, Turing machine input to n to x dot y, which gives us a point x y, and take the r, sorry, the um, halting symbol, halting state of my Turing machine. We take we take the region corresponding to it. Question. Is there some issue about like the region R being uncountable, but like you can only represent this? It's a good question, but no, because my um, this generalized shift map, the regions are just are finite regions, right? They just all of the regions can, that contain points, let's say, with digit 0, 1 after the decimal point. So that's just some square region of my subregion of my unit square that's even rational. Right. So this region is just some, you know, it's from x equals an eighth to x equals 2 eighths in the x direction and y equals 1 sixteenth to y equals 3 sixteenths in the, in the vertical direction. Say it depends on which universal Turing machine I pick and how to translate it, but it's that that's it's going to be some finite rational region, the re region that's defined by rational coordinates. Yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting there. This is where we're heading. Yeah, you have to bear with me. This is. Yeah. Right. I mean, you don't have to be too patient, because this is what I'm going to talk about right now. So thanks for asking that. Um, I'm sorry? I mean, I choose R to be the region that cor one. There's some finite subregion of my uh, square that corresponds to all points that are in halting states of my Turing machine. And that's the R I choose. Okay. So we have to choose that specific I mean, that proves the undecidability, yes. If you choose some different region R, you're asking about, does the Turing machine, uh, does the initial state ever end up in some other internal state of the Turing machine or some other configuration? And you know that may or may not be undecidable. depends on the Turing machine. Yeah. OK, so what on earth does this have to do with physics? Power, I mean, so far. Apparently nothing. What's, what Chris Moore did, the reason he did all of this, was what he could prove 
well, what he was interested in, or what he, one of the things he was interested in this paper is a problem called, does it come out of the box? Or at least he didn't call it this, I call it this. This is the does it call, come out of the box problem. So we want to write down a computational problem that corresponds to our physics question, right? Like slightly we did with complexity theory. My, let's make it a decision problem because that makes everything a bit easier to um, uh, okay. right over here. So what do I have? I have, here's the setup. I have a 3D box. And this box has a hole somewhere here in the bottom. And it has a hole somewhere here in the top. And we're going to shoot a particle in through this hole. And then the question is, does it come out here? So that's exactly this, does it come out of the box problem. Output. Yes, if particle exits through the top hole, no otherwise. This problem is undecidable. And I haven't told you what's inside the box. What's inside the box is a uh, box contains just a finite number of planar and parabolic surfaces. Yep. This is my first physical problem. Of course, it's a, it's a physical problem. This is about particle bouncing around in a box. This is a very physics problem. How fine is the finite number? It depends, uh, let's say, 10. <laughs> yeah, I'm safe. I think 10. The, the direction of the Matter, it goes in upwards vertically through some point. So it starts off, this is some region where the hole is, and it goes up inwards, it enters through some point x, y that's inside, this, it, that's where within the hole. Finite, say um, 1 over 16 by 1 over 16. So uh, the, the position of the planes and the as we should know them at the they're just some fixed positions, yeah. Yeah, they're not part of the problem. I just give you this box. I tell you where the planes, some this finite number of these ten different planes, planar and parabolic surfaces are. That's that I've told you here. And then my question is, okay, here's your here's the, oh no, I give it to you. I build this box. I go to the engineering shop, they get them to build it. I give you this box and I say, I'm gonna put a particle through in starting up here, does it come out or not? And your task is to tell me whether it does without trying it in the box. You have to predict. Okay, so how can we prove that this is um, undecidable? It's not so difficult. Um, so let me just draw pictures. So think again of our unit square. And now imagine that we had in the, that corresponded to generalized shift maps. Now let's send, imagine sending a particle up through that square. So first thing we can do is get it to go up through the square multiple times. I mean, infinitely, or at least over and over again, by just putting some reflectors here. I missed. Right, so that just reflect it round. So we can get it to travel repeatedly up through this unit square. Okay, these are 3D planes, I can't draw that good di 3D diagrams. So let's arrange, arrange planar mirrors so 
uh, goes back through the square. This is like a mock center. Oh, uh, it's this is just a classical particle, so there's no quantum interference. Okay, how do we do squeezing? And so what, what do I need to do? What I need to do is so that each time it passes through this plane, I want if it was in some region here that got squeezed and stretched to some new region, then I want this point via some other arrangement of mirrors and reflectors around here to move this point to where it would go under the map, the generalized shift map. So I'm not going to prove all of this, but squeezing and stretching, well, we can, can be implemented by, well, let's say squeezing and stretching, I can implement by parabolic reflectors. So I put two parabolas like that. For example, then this will focus the trajectories down, and then they'll come out like this. And this is squeezed a region in one direction. And so what the other option I operation I need is um, exchanging regions. And that's, I don't, I just need parabolic, uh, sorry, I just need linear reflectors to do that. Perhaps I'll leave that as an exercise. Draw a picture of how you can place mirrors so that um, it exchanges two regions. I just have an arrangement of mirrors that things over here get bounced over there and things coming over here get bounced over there. So it's not difficult. Okay, and like this, but now, now I have all of the elements I need to implement my map F, my map G, and sigma, the shift map. Or rather, to implement the squeezing and stretching and the region exchange that corresponds to that as a map on the unit square. So like this, I, and so then I just choose this region here to be where the particle, the region, uh, put the hole above the region that corresponds to halting. Put the, here I put the uh, hole below the region of my plane inside here, the planar surface that we're, shooting, we're imagining going through repeatedly, um, below the place where uh, this corresponds to being a, the Turing machine being in its initial state with some finite number of symbols on the um, tape, which is given by the position x and y. OK, and now you already complain that this is very still a toy physics problem. We're a bit closer, though, than Turing machines, right? I mean, this is now about particles bouncing in planar surfaces. What you can also do with this, and I'm going to give even less detail about this, is that uh, it's nice, this nice toy kind of example with mirrors and planar surfaces. Um, it's kind of easy to understand sort of how it goes, and it's, uh, it's kind of a nice toy example. But what you can also do by the same kind of idea with a little bit more maths is to prove that um, you can actually do something similar. You can write down a smooth potential in 3D such that classical dynamics of a particle within moving in that potential in 3D is undecidable. And that was the real, that's the main, main result in uh, Chris Moore's paper. So the hard part is you need to make this potential smooth. But remember, these re the, what's the argument? The, let me write it down, and then I'll, I'll talk about it. So um, similar by similar methods, again, reduction from the generalized shift map, or the, there are the corresponding maps on unit squares. So by similar methods, can prove undecidability of particle dynamics, classical particle dynamics, single particle dynamics even, in a 3D smooth potential. OK, and the only thing that's maybe not so trivial is making this smooth but remember that I, all of my diagrams I've closed up the gaps between these regions there are really gaps here 
what you need to do is that in each region, the map is piecewise linear. So that's fine. That's smooth. I need to connect up these smooth linear functions by something smooth. But I can always connect those up by some C infinity function, so some infinitely differentiable function that interpolates between the regions in the gaps. And then I have to embed this into 3D, which you can look at the paper to see how the argument goes of how you can embed it in a way that gives you a smooth potential. OK. I've kind of sketched how this, argu this proof goes, in because you know, I think it's nice to see where this comes from. It's not magic. Um, what do we learn from this physically? Right. You know, it's like a cute toy result, but do we actually learn any, any physics from this? Well, I'm going to come back to what I started saying. We started with the Smail horseshoe map, which is the, so the shift map, the Smail horseshoe. This is a classic example of chaos, of chaotic dynamics. Why? Because because if we start with some point n, if n and n primed differ only after the say the kth bit, or kth digit, then the difference between those two starting points is 2 to the minus l, k, sorry. But that difference grows exponentially as we shift the decimal point to the right. right. But so f of n iterated t times goes as 2 to the t times epsilon. And this is just the butterfly effect. We start from two initial states, initial configurations that are arbitrarily close together, and they diverge exponentially in time as our time evolves. So this is a, a classic toy model of chaotic dynamics. And indeed, in a fairly many, it's not true that all chaotic dam dynamics is, has this embedded at its heart, but a large class of chaotic dynamics is actually um, equivalent, in a certain sense, to this smell horseshoe map. OK, but that was just the shift map. You know, on the other hand, so this is the butterfly effect. The hallmark of chaos. Small differences in the initial point or small uncertainties. You know, if we don't know the initial point, we only know it within epsilon, then we don't know how to predict Epsilon uncertainty means we can't. We can only predict. We, we can only predict the dynamics beyond up to about log one over epsilon. <coughs> about five days for weather systems. Okay. But on the other hand, if we know the uh, if we know the initial position to infinite precision, if we know the initial value of n to infinite precision, then it's trivial to predict the dynamics indefinitely far in the future. If we know the initial point exactly, trivial to predict. To Time infinite, infinite time. Right. Then we're just going to shift the decimal point along. We'll keep multiplying by two. Okay. What about the generalized shift map? The generalized shift map. Um, can, can you know it exactly? The question is if you can know it exactly. Of course, I can give you a fine um, binary string. So uh, okay, so under the generalized shift map, if I start with two different points that are close together, well, we typically expect we expect this to diverge no, sorry, it, always. It's going to diverge unless it is the shift map, it's going to diverge slower. Why? Because under the generalized shift map, sometimes we shift left, sometimes we shift right, right? Rather than always shifting in one direction. So we're not going to diverge as quickly. We might expect something like 2 to the root t 
though it's very hard to compute what the direct right because we expect it to kind of like a random walk, maybe, typically. So it would diverge as root t, 2 to the root t instead of 2 to the t. Of course, actually figuring out how fast that diverges, it's a Turing machine. We can't. It's uncomputable. But even if we know the initial point exactly, we still can't predict its future dynamics. Because it's undecidable. And in fact, not only can we not predict where the particle will go, will end up, we can't compute any properties, dynamical properties of this system. We can't compute Lyapunov exponents. We can't compute where the fixed points are. We can't compute uh, where, what the cycle, uh, any periodic points. Um, and why? Well, basically, that's by Rice's theorem, which we saw in the first lecture. Right? Whereas for chaotic systems, you cannot predict the exact behavior of the system, but you can predict statistical properties of it, like your Apanov exponents, so how fast, um, how, how fast things diverge. You can find fixed points it's, and cycles, etc. And that's indeed what you do in I mean, a lot of chaos theory is about analyzing those kind of properties of dynamical maps. For these generalized shift maps, we've got a qualitatively different type of complex dynamics here. Right? It's not the same as chaos. It's something qualitatively different that we've predicted by building a smooth potential and particles and what. So that wasn't something that we necessarily knew we had before. We didn't know we could have that. That's a qualitatively different thing than what we had from chaos theory. OK. Any questions? Oh, goodness me, hundreds. Uh, start here. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Uh, I want to ask you. <laughs> Where's the hidden infinity? Good. So, but thank you. I told you to keep a keep that question in mind for the whole lecture, and thanks for doing that. I forgot. So, can anyone see where the hidden infinity is here? But your position, knowing it, it's a real number. Right. It's not real. Uh, arbitrary, precise rationals. But indeed, this depends on the fact that I can choose my initial trajectory to go through any point specified by rational coordinates. So that gives me a countable infinity number of a countable infinity of different problem instances. Right. But it's really, it's, you have to think a little bit to see where the infinity is here. Because the box is finite, there's a finite number of elements inside. All of these elements are at positions that can be given by rational coordinates. So thanks a lot for asking that. Another one? Or, yeah? No. Could be, uh, you could have an input to the universal Turing machine that halts after two steps. For example, it could be that it checks whether the first bit is a 1, and if it is, it halts. And on, if the first bit isn't a 1, it actually runs the proper universal Turing machine. Then it will exit. But, but say I can just, I mean, in principle, I could do a simulation of this particle, right? Mm -hmm. Just that in fact, you have error or something. No, no, no. This is a really critical point. You can simulate this Turing machine perfectly. This entire particle dynamics system, you can simulate it perfectly to no errors, because everything is rational. Right? You can do ap rational arithmetic on your computer and... Okay, assuming in your memory can keep on, you can keep on adding more RAM when your rational numbers get really, really precise. You can simulate this perfectly. The problem is you will never know if it exits the box because if it doesn't exit the box, it could bounce around inside it in a way that never repeats and carries on forever. Just like a Turing machine, you can't tell if it doesn't halt. Uh, and this is what I was saying. So it will never leave the box in the simulation. No, because maybe it will. It might be an instance that halts and then it will leave, your bo leave the box. So halting instances, uh, things that correspond to halting instances, it leaves the box. Things that don't, it never, it always stays inside. Okay, one second. Is uh, undecidability here always in some way related to the halting problem of the Turing machine, or is there other instances? Okay, that's a really nice question. Um, uh, you can prove undecidability not by reduction from the halting problem. There are other undecidable problems that are not equivalent to the tur to halting problem on Turing machines. In fact, there are undecidable problems that are even more undecidable than the halting problem, which I don't have time to talk about. Um, but typically, at least in all of the examples, I know the proof, at least of these things where it's uh, under computability applied in some sense to physics questions, to idealized physics questions, yes, it's by reduction from halting. But it doesn't have to be, in, at least in 
computability research, you have problems that are undecidable for other reasons. Just, yeah. Perturbations to what? The position of the mirrors or? Um, that is unfortunately, by Rice's theorem, undecidable. <laughs> I'm being slightly glib. Um, it's really, it's, it's very, very difficult to prove anything either way because of Rice's theorem. So if you formulate that question in a, very, in a mathematically precise way, typically how you try to formulate it, you end up with something that you can prove you can never decide. Okay. And that might be that, so um, there may be ways of formulating it where it's trivially the case that it is decidable, but then it's probably because you haven't quite captured the right, you know. So, uh, it's, uh, Rice's theorem is really uh, an issue. It typically means once you've got something that's got undecidable behavior, pretty much any question you want to ask is undecidable. Okay. okay, let me, for the last half hour of this lecture, give you even less of a, even less detail about a quantum result, undecidability result since I guess it's nice to okay arbitrary finite binary string just like my Turing machine the input is a finite number of non-blank symbols but then it's undecidable for completely trivial reasons I don't even get a chance to read the input. And I have to, right, if my input is infinite, I don't even get to read the input in, in finite time. So it's undecidable in a way that's completely trivial and not interesting and doesn't even really make sense. No, it means that you've just asked a stupid question. I mean, not you, but the that, <laughs> not you, not you personally, but. No, I mean, even in our first lecture, um, the, we always, the input to our computational problems always has to be finite input, right? Remember the size of the computation, the input? The size of the computational problem is the number of non-blank symbols on a Turing machine, or the number of bits, right? So our computational problems, we by definition have inputs that are expressible in a finite number of bits. Otherwise, even computability theory, you can't say anything. It doesn't make sense, right? Okay, I want to move on to the quantum example, since this is a summer school about quantum things. So my final example is undecidability of the spectral gap. Really I'm only going to have time to tell you what the problem is and then talk about what physics, what I think, you know, what kind of physics do we, can we extract from this result? And I'm not going to be, I think I probably w won't even give you even a flavor of the proof. Um, let's see. So let me just, let me at least tell you what the result is. So we're thinking about, now we have quantum systems, so we're back on familiar territory, this classical dynamic stuff. This is, this is undergraduate physics, it's a long time ago, you probably forgot it by now. But this, now we're back to Hamiltonians, so familiar territory. So we have a lattice. I'm going to think about Hamiltonians on a 2D lattice, a uh, spin lattice. So each, um, each particle here is a qubit or a qdit. Uh, but now they have nearest neighbor interactions. Our Hamiltonian is, let's write h of l, is nearest neighbor interactions on a 2D square lattice. h is always the same. So this is a tra I'm thinking about translationally invariant models. So h is the same everywhere, uh, and this l is my lattice size. So it's an l by l lattice. Okay. So that's the kind of that's the systems. I'm, that's the Hamiltonians I'm going to be talking about. Okay. So what we saw an example of Hamiltonian in Hamiltonian complexity of a of a complexity theoretic result about Hamiltonians, but on a finite number of particles. In Kitev's results, they didn't have any geometrical structure. I mentioned, but didn't prove you uh, prove at all. Uh, but mentioned at least that this result had been improved subsequent to Kitai's original one to, for example, 2D lattice of qubits um, and even to 1D, uh, 1D spin chains. You've still got QMA hardness, but always for finite numbers of particles, right? Because it's complexity theory. Our problems were, were on finite instances with, that are finite, um, arbitrarily large, but finite number of particles. But in condensed matter physics, a lot of the things that we care about are properties that only really make sense, strictly speaking, in the thermodynamic limit. 
For example, phase transitions. Right? Fa you can only have phase transitions, strictly speaking, in the, infinite, in the limit where you have an infinitely large system. And the spec the and phase transitions, why are phase transitions? Well, phase transitions, hopefully, I don't have to convince you that there's something interesting and important to study in physics. But what do they have to do with spectral gaps? Well, everything. Phase transitions occur. No, let me get this the right way around. Phase transition implies the spectral gap closes as you at that at the critical point. Implies phase transition implies vanishing spectral gap. In mathematical physics, that's the definition of a phase transition or a critical point rather. So if we want to understand phase diagrams of quantum systems, so quantum phase diagrams, zero temperature phase diagrams, or low temperature, then what we're trying to understand is, as I vary parameters in the Hamiltonian, where does the gap close? And at those points, you can have a phase transition. And where the gap is, where you have gap, that's in regions that are gaps, that's where you're in a, within a phase, a stable phase. OK, so what is the, um, what is the spectral gap? Well, it's just the difference. Okay, but so I'm, so to finish the story. So because motivated by f that phase transitions for this spectral back problem, I'm not interested in finite systems. I'm interested in systems in the thermodynamic limit. So I'm interested in so finite systems are always gapped because a finite dimensional matrix is always implies discrete spectrum implies gapped. Right. The gap might be very small, but you always, strictly speaking, have a gapped system in a, if it's finite. So I'm interested in, so I'm, that means that I'm, what I'm interested in is taking L to infinity if I want, want to study phase transitions. In other words, I'm interested in the thermodynamic limit of my spin, my spin lattice. So what's the spectral gap? So for lattice size L, I just define the gap as the difference between the first excited state, so the second smallest and the smallest eigenvalue. So this is the second smallest eigenvalue. And this is the ground state energy, smallest eigenvalue. And now so that's just the gap for a finite lattice size. And now, this, now I want to tell you what a gapped, what I'm going to call a gapped and a gapless system. So gapped, I'm going to define precisely like this. There's some lattice size L, finite and some finite value delta, such that if I take any lattice size bigger than that, then two things. I'm going to require that h of l, for, so that's for all lattice sizes bigger than some finite size, that the ground state is unique. So ds now in this part means ground state, not generalized shift. And secondly, that for all sizes bigger than some threshold, the spectral gap, in this sense, is bigger than this value delta. So what does this mean? This means that, well, one thing it means is that I take the, as I take L to infinity, the system is gapped in that limit, right? Because the limit of L goes to infinity has to be bigger than or equal to delta. So the limit of the spectral gap in the, the spectral gap in the, in the thermodynamic limit is, is, is bigger than delta. But in fact, it requires something more than that. It requires that this, uh, it, it, there's a uniformity condition here. This, is, this should not hold just in the limit, but this should hold, once we get to some size, bigger than, let's say, 100 by 100 lattices, then nothing strange happens. It's always gapped from then on. And this gap doesn't kind of oscillate, go up and down. It's not difficult to construct systems where that kind of thing happens, where the gap appears and vanishes. Um, so I'm ruling that out by definition. I want to have well-behaved gap systems. Is, is a uh, null spectral gap a trivial solution? You mean all eigenvalues equal to the ground state? Yeah. I'll come to that. Today? Right now. Okay. OK. 
And now I need to tell you what gapless is. I'm going to draw a diagram instead of defining it. I can define it properly with epsilons and deltas. OK, so this, what, do, what is the picture you have in mind? Here's the energy spectrum of the system. Here's the ground state. Um, unique ground state, and then my spectrum is there's at least a gap of at least delta, and then whatever happens up here in the spectrum. Gapless, I want that in the thermodynamic limit, my spectrum is continuous above the ground state. Okay, and I can define that properly with epsilons and deltas and blah, 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 and, t and the, what the prop behavior as L goes to infinity, but I think the picture is probably more informative. Okay? So note that gapless does not, is not the negation of gapped. Okay? Gapless does not equal not gapped here. Right? For example, systems with degenerate ground states doesn't fall into either case. Okay. Why am I ruling out? There's plenty of systems with degenerate ground states that you can write down. Why am I ruling these out? I want to rule out these ambiguous cases. So I'm going to only call something gapless that every physicist agrees is gapless. And I'm only going to call something gapped where every physicist will agree that it's gapped. Okay. And I'm going to just try to avoid the ambiguous cases. And we'll see in a moment. And Actually, I'm going to prove undecidability of this problem. So remember, what I, how do I formalize this? I'm going to give a promise that for the system I construct, I give you, a, for the Hamiltonians I look at, I promise that either this is true or that is true. And now you remember the story from the kit I have QMA hardness result, right? Because I'm proving a hardness result, in this case a very hardness result, an undecidability, giving this promise makes my results stronger, not weaker. Okay? So I can I'm going to prove undecidability by even under the promise that the behavior is totally unambiguously gapped or un unambiguously gapless. And that makes my undecidability result stronger, not weaker. OK, and now I'm pretty much done. All I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what the spectral gap problem is. And the result is that the, this problem is undecidable. So. input Hamiltonian. No, but this is a trans I need a finite amount of data to express my Hamiltonian, right? Because this, for this to be meaningful. But I'm, that's why I'm, I'm looking at translationally invariant systems. Okay? I can specify the uh, Hamiltonian entirely by just giving the one local interaction. And the Hamiltonians just have that everywhere, right? So I only need to, write, I only need to give one interaction term, and I've specified the whole Ham Hamiltonian. So this is just an interaction it's just a matrix between two qubits. It's an interaction between two qubits. And I need to be a bit careful here. I actually need this to be so this is a d squared by d squared matrix. But I could cheat. And I want to make sure I don't cheat. This is promising that I'm not in an ambiguous case is one way of, making, of being absolutely clear that I'm not cheating. I also have to not cheat by giving, I, these are matrix elements. Right? These are real numbers, or complex numbers even. And there are complex numbers that I can specify that are uncomputable. Consequence of undecided behavior of halting, blah, blah, blah. But if I, one of my matrix elements, so these are m numbers that I can specify in some sense, but I can actually never, in terms of a program to compute them, except it's not actually a useful program, it's one that it'll never halt. I can never, it'll never actually be able to compute the number. So the numbers that actually can't be computed, right? There's numbers I can e express in mathematics, but they cannot be computed by any Turing machine. And if I put one of those numbers in, my ham in one of the matrix elements of my Hamiltonian, well, whatever program is, whatever Turing machine I try and construct to try and decide this problem, doesn't even figure out what the matrix elements are. Right? So it can't even figure out what the Hamiltonian is, let alone analyze its spectrum. I need to make sure I'm not cheating. Okay? And I'm going to do that by, it will be enough to require that these are computable numbers. But I'm actually going to do something a bit stronger. I'm going to require that they're algebraic numbers. Algebraic numbers are very beautifully computable and very, very well behaved. So I'm going to restrict to algebraic numbers. It's actually, in the real result, it's essentially restricted to uh, rational numbers, in fact. But so if you restrict it to the complex numbers, it's not guaranteed that it's computable, you restrict to the algebraic numbers. Yep. Well, that's yep. OK, so the result that I proved with so this is by myself, David Perez Garcia, who's in Madrid, and Michel Wolf, who's in Munich. 
in 2015. The spec that we proved that the spectral gap problem is undecidable. So I give you just a finite a matrix that's and D for for some is undecidable for D right, fixed D for some D which I could give you a value for but I'm not going for all well you prove it's undecidable for all for some D and that improves it's undecidable for any bigger local Hilbert space dimension. So for Q dits, for uh, where uh, that as long as you've got Q dits that are bigger than some fixed value of D zero. Okay. This is a very big value, fixed value, some huge fixed value of D. I don't know exactly what it is. We didn't work it out. It's I don't know ten to the hundred. Your local your spin you're on spin ten to the hundred particles. That's probably safe. But nonetheless, it's some fixed value, and it's not something uncomputable. It's a, if you went to the effort, you could actually, I could actually tell you what that number is by going through the construction and just adding, counting up how much we needed. Good. Okay. So for in the last, yeah. Nearest neighbor, Qdit interactions on 2D square lattice, and the same interaction over translation invariant. Yeah. Why? Sorry. Oh, just it just comes from some the construction, right? So, just like in the Gottesman Irani's construction of QMA hardness of translation variant systems on the line, you needed to de uh, roughly a million. For the non-translation variant construction on a line, the best known is d equals eight. But this is an artifact of you to prove this result. And unfortunately, I don't have any time to give you a even a flavour of the proof. Really, maybe I'll try and say like thirty sec, two minutes on it. Um, it's just, you know, that's what we managed in, in the paper. And for sure you can get it down. We even know techniques to get it down. We weren't trying to. We were just trying to prove the result for some, actual, some fixed value. That was hard enough. Um, um, so that, that's all. Um, I don't think there's anything fundamental to this. This is just what we could prove, and you can almost certainly reduce this. But I don't know how much you can reduce it. That's a very interesting question. Rationals. But this is not quite, I mean, they're algebraic numbers. Th it's in fact, al but the only reason it's algebraic numbers is you have things like e to the i phi for a rational phi, okay. which is algebraic because it's sines and cosines, but it's... Um, but you just spent some, some time uh, talking about the physical... Yes, design. that's what I want to do now. Yeah. So, okay, so if you want to have a, an idea of how this proof works, it's very much draws on comple Hamiltonian complexity theory. So indeed, part of this is a history state construction. Kind of the first idea you'd have is, well, I know how to encode computation in the ground state of quantum systems. Why don't I encode the evolution of a universal Turing machine and then put an energy penalty on halting? And unfortunately, that totally fails um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, firstly, that, that Hamiltonian, for, for a start, is not translation invariant or nearest neighbor or anything. Okay, but then you go, okay, well, there's Gottesman and Narani did all the work of doing it translation invariantly. So let's use that. And the way that Gottesman and Narani got translation invariance is by encoding Turing machines instead of circuits and then 30 pages of hard work to actually make that idea work. So then you can think, okay, I'd use that, but uh, that doesn't work either, because firstly, how do you initialize the input to the Turing machine? Gottesman and Irani do use the length of the chain in a very clever way, but we're in the thermodynamic limit, so there is no, the chain length isn't a parameter anymore, it's gone to infinity, so that's no good. So how do you, how do you feed some input to the Turing machine that's encoded in this Hamiltonian? Second problem, not difficult to show that uh, Anything you construct like that is gapless, always. So the problem is, is trivially decidable. You don't even have to look at the Hamiltonian and just say gapless. That's the answer from that construction. So you have to do... Um, so to get around that problem, what do we do? So what, well, what we do to feed input into the Turing machine, the only thing we have is this finite number of matrix elements H. Right? So somehow we've got to put the entire arbitrary large inputs to a Turing machine into a matrix element here. And then somehow we've got to extract that and feed it as input to a Turing machine. So how do we do that? Well, we have one pr n matrix element of this Hamiltonian that's got some, that's some phase. And then in this history state in construction, we encode the quantum phase estimation algorithm, which does phase estimation to extract the, that phase from the entry of the Hamiltonian, or the way it, it coded there, all within a history state construction, <coughs> and then feed that as input to a Turing machine. 
And unfortunately, that needs, Turing, that needs particular weird properties of, we need a quantum Turing machine to do phase estimation with some very bizarre properties that no one cared about before. Uh, so it's not in the literature. So we spent 30 pages proving that that exists by actually constructing a quantum Turing machine that does it. It's there in the paper in full, the entire transition rule table of this machine. Um, I like to claim that I'm the third person after Ber Bernstein and Vazirani to actually sit down and program a quantum Turing machine. And you don't want to do it. It's very tedious. OK, but you're still not done. We've still got the problem that in the limit, for this, th now we've done this. OK, we can get the input in there. But as you take the thermodynamic limit, it's triv easy to show that this system is always gapless. So it's still always trivially decidable. You just say, it's gapless. Right, it's never gapped. So then we also have to put this together. We need to amplify the gap somehow. So what we, what we do is instead of having just, we go to 2D. And we inspired by some undecidability results of the tiling problems in 2D, so classic, classical results from the 60s and 70s that, or that construct, they use aperiodic tiles. So you, have a pat, you can have, uh, let's say, cl classical Hamiltonians where the ground state has a frac is not periodic, even though the Hamiltonian is, uh, is, uh, is the tra Hamiltonian is translation invariant. Of, it's of the form like that I've written down there, but classical now, so everything's diagonal. And yet the ground state has a fractal aperiodic pattern. Uh, this is the aperiodic tilings proven in the 60s and 70s. And we use a particular one. And what this lets us do is it puts, we're, it lets us put Gottesman Irani chains of all possible different lengths distributed around the 2D lattice. All, and each length has finite density. And now, some of these are so short, there's not enough space to finish the computation. Even if it halted, you don't find out because it, doesn't, it runs out of tape before it, and runs out of time before it gets to that point. But eventually, because you have all possible lengths, there's going to be, if the Turing machine halts, then there will be some length on which that's long enough to actually see that. And that picks up some energy from the penalty term, just the, and that very analogous to the output penalty term we put into Kitayev's. Hamiltonian, but now it's a penalty term that penal gives extra energy to halting states. And now the point is you pick up a finite density of energy contributions. So these energy contributions can be arbitrarily small. They decay very quickly the longer the, the chain is. But there's some finite number, and you pick, up a f you pick up a finite density of these. So now you've picked up a finite energy density in the halting case, and zero energy density in the non-halting case, because you never pick up these energy penalties. That gives you undecidability of the ground state energy density, but with no promise that the, so it's uh, uh, undecidability of the ground state energy density probably where the energy, asking whether the energy density is either zero or positive, but it could be an un uncomputably small positive number. It's not a very interesting problem. Physically, it's irrelevant. But the point is that finite ground state energy density, even if it's uncomputably small, corresponds to infinite energy because we have a finite energy density, but now our lattice is, L by L, so we have L squared and L is going to infinity. So now we've got finite energy density, that means we have fi infinite energy in the limit, ground state energy. And then we have another construction that puts that together with some gapless and gapped Hamiltonians such that the, um, essentially there's, in the gapped case, in the gapless case, the spectrum looks like this. And hidden in here is the spectrum of some other Hamiltonian that's gapped, but it's a higher energy and it's at some excited state. But in the halting case, this whole continuous part of the spectrum gets shoved upwards in energy, in fact, by an infinite amount, and lives up here. And that opens up, reveals, if you like, the low energy spectrum becomes the spectrum from this gapped Hamiltonian that goes into the construction. So 10 pages of proving results about classical tilings that we need that weren't known. Another 30 pages about putting everything together. And you get to the whole proof is currently at 127 pages. And it's on the archive. You can go and read it. If you want a lighter weight overview, a very, very high level impressionist sketch of the proof, I've put in the lecture notes that I'll upload. If you want a slightly less impressionistic sketch, if you look at the supplementary material to the short version of the paper, um, there's a 30 page overview of the proof that sort of explains how the proof works, but without the full technical details. So there's various, you can read this in a fractal way. You can start with the very zoomed out view for my lecture notes, then you can read the nature paper for, no, don't read the nature paper. It's just read the supplementary material to the nature paper that gives a slightly more detailed overview, and then you can read the full thing. OK, two minutes on what do we learn about the physics from this. Um, OK, I mean, I guess it's obvious where the infinity is hiding here, right? Um, it's the fact that this is a result about the thermodynamic limit. L is going to infinity. Okay. 
And in the real, in real world, you don't, in your lab, have a, typically we, you know, we, we deal with a the thermodynamic limit. We typically talk about the thermodynamic limit in physics. We talk about phase transitions as though we're actually in the thermodynamic limit. But in reality, we have whatever, 10 to the 23 atoms or something. It's close enough to infinity to mean that experimentally we can't see the difference typically. But it's not strictly speaking infinite. So we don't actually have and can't build this in the lab. We can't build an infinitely large, even with the best ion trap um, quantum computing technology or superconducting circuits or optical lattices, these are all finite numbers of qubits, even if they're maybe very large, like, you know, 50 of them. Uh, it's amazing, not really large number. It's pretty close to infinity, but not enough for this result. Um, so does this mean that this has no relevance whatsoever? And the answer, I think, is, n well, the answer is no, because, and it's, again, what I said at the beginning, there's, when you have undecidability and some idealized limit, typically there's some reflection of that in finite size. So what does this mean? In the lab, you can build a large sample of this material, in principle, right? and then you can poke it. The spectral gap is something you can measure experimentally by neutron scattering, for example. So you do your experiments, and you find that the system is... Um, here's one implication. You find that the system is gapped. Right? So you take a sample that's that big, and you look at the spectrum, and the spectrum looks like this. Okay? Then you double your sample size just to check. Everything looks fine gap is still delta. But then you're annoying grad student. You know, so you write the paper. It's very nice. You've understood this. Characterize this gap system. It's very important. And then your annoying grad student goes and adds one extra atom to the system and remeasures it. And suddenly what you thought was gapped turns out it's gapless. And there's no way of knowing if one extra atom would change the physics of this completely. And indeed, maybe one extra atom doesn't change it. You'll never know if two extra atoms would change it or not. And that's, the, that's one implication of undecidability. You cannot extrapolate the large-scale behavior of, of this material from any finite sample. You never know if it, the physics of this material will change completely if you increase the size. And you have no idea what size you have to go to to tell. Because the, the size at which this swap from gapless or gaps to gap, gapless physics occurs is an uncomputable number. So but you can prove that you can never figure out how big... What, how, if the material properties will change dramatically at some size. And in a follow-up paper more recently, we've constructed some toy examples of that that don't work in dimension d to the 100, 10 to the 100, but work like, for example, in dimension 6, where you get that kind of behavior, where for very large but, uh, lattices, you have one type of physics, and then you increase it beyond that, you, get, uh, you go from a classical trivial product ground state to topologically ordered quant ground state. So we, I mean, the title of this paper is Size-Driven Phase Transitions. They're not quite phase transitions in the traditional sense, but they're, they're this size-driven phase transition-like behavior. So they're actually toy examples that are much closer to something you could build in the lab. They're not undecidable, of course. That's why we could prove things about them. Is it, is it immediate? You just like, how, how yes. one atom just drops to gap. Yes, that's very important. So but this is because of my strong definition of gap. Right? The gap is delta and is not closing all the way up to that threshold. And then it becomes continuous. Okay, strictly speaking, it's still fine. So it becomes very dense, and as you keep on growing it, it, it but experimentally, it's indistinguishable from continuous. Yeah. So it's a dramatic, you cannot see any hint of this. It's not a crossover effect like you see in condensed matter in physics systems. As you approach a kind of phase transition, and you can get finite size crossover effects. There's no, evid there's no hint that this is going to happen. Everything looks completely stable until suddenly it switches. Another implication, physics implication you can draw from this, is that the phase diagrams of these systems are extremely complicated. All right? They're so com com convoluted, the phase diagram of this Hamiltonian, that it's actually uncomputable what the phase diagram is. Arbitrarily close to some gap, so here's my phase diagram. Uh, if I draw the gap points in, you know, well, let's draw the gapless points in white. If I zoom in, arbitrarily close to a gap point are gapless points and vice versa. And if I zoom in, that keeps on happening. I can never, so arbitrary close to any gap, or to gap points or gapless points and vice versa. Arbitrary close to gapless points in the phase diagram and gap points. Moving an, inf an infinitesimal distance in the phase diagram, you drive the system through infinitely many phase transitions. So this is, you've just, you saw um, in John Martinez's lecture, an example of the Hofstadter butterfly, which is a much simpler system with a fractal phase diagram. This is just like my 3D particle dynamics. This is a qualitatively different type of complexity of the phase diagram in that Fractal phase diagrams are not as badly complex as this is. This is a qualitatively different type of complex phase diagram. 
Okay, I think with that I can, I'll end. I mean, uh, what I wanted to tell you, I hope this has, has convinced you that you can draw physics um, implication. Interesting physics comes out of undecidability into this idealized limit. The, I, the undecidability is some mathematical idealization, but it has implications for the finite size systems that you can at least imagine building in a laboratory. And so with that, thanks a lot for listening. I hope I've interested you in computability and complexity theory. Let's see. I saw your hand first. So. Uh, so, based on this thing, it seems like uh, you just said we can't necessarily, uh, I guess, predict yeah. large scale stuff from smaller scale. But in practice, then why, why do we sort of you know, take for granted that? You know, why does it work? Not, yeah. So, this is a very important point. So, it's a very good question. Undecidability says that there are some cases you can't predict. It doesn't say that you can't predict anything. Right? And so most of the physics systems we have do not look like this incredibly complicated two-body interaction between massive spins. They look like something much simpler and uh, turn out to be something you can. It doesn't have that bad behavior, or at least as far as we know it doesn't. Some cases in theoretical condensed matter we can prove it. It's actually very difficult to uh, prove uh, properties about spectral gaps of condensed matter systems. There's a few cases where you can, I mean, exactly some exactly solvable models, and most it's really hard to do. But most of them are, seem to be fairly well behaved numerically, at least. There's some of the big open questions in physics, in theoretical physics, are to do with spectral gaps. So in condensed matter, like the Haldane gap conjecture has been open for 30 years. That's about the spin one Heisenberg chain. It's about the simplest Hamiltonian you can write down. We don't know how to prove if it's gapped or not. Another example is the existence of topological spin liquid phases. We know there are topological spin liquids. We don't know if there are Hamiltonians that are gapped that have those as their ground state. So is there an actual phase, a stable phase of topological spin liquids? Unknown. There are models that might, might well be examples, candidates, can't prove the gap. Yang-Mills mass gap problem right, in, quantum, in f quantum field theory. It's not, I mean, not about many body systems in this sense, but about quantum field theories. It's a slightly different notion of gap. But again, a million dollars for that one. We don't know. Actually, there we don't even know how to write down the question, let alone prove something about the spectral gap. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and we sort of know that computing, understanding many body quantum systems is quite difficult. We, complexity theory tells us that as well. The undecidability tells us that for things about the spectral gap, we know it's really, really, really difficult in general. So we expect to hit hard cases, but not everything is hard. Some cases will be easy and we can actually do something. Rice's theorem tells us that there's no way of telling which ones are going to be easy and which ones are hard. It's undecidable. Um, pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I was thinking of like these candidates that are Kagam on the Kagame lattice um, with that are constructed from tensor network methods where there's candidate Hamiltonians and they claim there in those papers that, that it's the first example of a Hamiltonian with topological spin liquid with some extra conditions. I don't know. I'm not an expert. Good, thanks for asking that. I didn't have time to, to mention that. You actually know the answer. We saw it in the first lecture, right? Undecidability of halting um, gave us Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. Undecidability in this of the spectral gap problem implies that there exists some specific Hamiltonian, not a family. So this is a family of Hamiltonians with one parameter. It's a one parameter family of Hamiltonians. Parameter is phi, this phase that goes into this matrix element. This, the undecidability of this implies that there exists one instance of these, of this Hamiltonian, for which, I mean, you choose the or whatever axiomatization of mathematics you want to work in, and I'll give you back a Hamiltonian for which, whether it's gapped or gapless, is simply not provable in, that, in mathematics, in your version of mathematics. The problem is it's like Gödel's first incompleteness theorem. I can't tell you which instance. I can just prove there exists one. And to get kind of undecidability of something like the un, the, what you need for something like Haldane to prove that like, some of these conjectures are undecidable, which kind of like it's very tempting to speculate that maybe Yang Mills mass gap is unproven because in fact it can't be proven, or Haldane conjecture is open because it can't be proven. But those are about specific instances. And you need something like Gödel's second incompleteness theorem for a very, very simple system that's not some artificially contrived one on top of that. And I don't have tools to do that. I don't know. Um, this implies that it could happen. That's all. It's a very interesting question. And you know, go, go and work on it and solve it. Sure.
No, that's just. Uh, not at all. That just makes life harder, right? That just tying our hands behind our back and one leg, as well, right? This is the simplest ham restricting ourselves to very simple classes of Hamiltonian. If you allow me more general Hamiltonians, I can prove the result more easily. Not easily, but a bit more easily. That would just, I mean, this is, if you give me three, n you know, next to nearest neighbor interactions, well, nearest neighbor is just a special case of that, so I, there's nothing to do, right? I can probably get the dimension down a bit if you let me have next to nearest neighbor interactions. So it makes like, the more you relax the constraints on the Hamiltonian, the easier it becomes to prove. So this is the strongest result in a sense. So all small size MDL <coughs> studies could be completely They could be. I wouldn't expect they are, right? I bet they're not. I mean, they may. Uh, it seems unlikely that they're hitting. Um, why would this is very contrived? It's Hamiltonian. It's not a natural Hamiltonian. Is does undecided really occur for natural Hamiltonians? Very interesting question. Open. Go and work on it. So probably not. No, they're probably fine. But it does raise doubts. Or in lattice QCD, yeah. they see strong evidence of a mass gap. But it could be they just needed to add one more site to the lattice, and everything would have changed. And if they do add one more site, I'll just go back and say, well, maybe it's just one more. <laughs> No, Young-Mills is really a different question about field theories. And part one of the Young-Mills mass gap problem is to figure out what Young-Mills theory is. And that's the hard part of the Young-Mills mass gap problem. The easy part is figuring out its spectral, its, whether it has a mass gap or not. The hard part of figuring out what the question is. And I'm genuine, if you look at the statement of the problem, it's in two parts. And uh, Okay, I think at this point I'm going to... I should probably stop and then I'm ha I'll, just one, one I'll wait. Uh, I'm going to, because Graham's glaring at me. Yeah. I'm sure he is. I can't see yeah, him, but I'm sure he's Does this stuff have anything to do with the problem of consciousness? No. Uh, okay, that was easy. Okay, so I, I'll, I'm happy to carry on discussing at the front. I think I should probably end the lecture here.